Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. It's Hannah. Here we talk about books, chronic illness, sometimes knitting and life in Amsterdam. If you're new, hi, hello. Thanks for joining me. Would love it if you subscribe. And if you've been here a while, welcome back. Um, today we're doing one of my most popular and favorite videos to film, which is books on my radar, where I share with you <coughs> upcoming titles for like new releases, literary fiction, short stories, memoir, um, non-fiction books, pop culture books, anything that I think is of interest to me and as a reflection hopefully we interested to my audience and you guys so yeah March is some really exciting literary titles that I have had on my radar for a while and like I'm waiting for as well as some books I had just found in my research so I guess we'll start at the beginning um it is kind of noisy in my apartment or well, not in my apartment but to the right of me there is the nursery and they're on break time and at the front our entire road is being dug up so I really hope that with the microphone and me moving to a different part from where I normally film although this is a quite a nice spot to film as you can see part of my bookshelf my favorite piece of art my favorite books in the world on that stack um so yeah excuse the noise I'm sorry I have done as much as I can to mitigate it Okay, let's just get started. The first book, Grow Where They Fall by Michael Donker. This book has been blurbed by one of my favourite writers, Ashley Hickson Lovance, who is a um, brilliant writer who wrote Your Show, which was like a fictionalised memoir of the first black British referee. And Ashley's so lovely, so kind, such a good soul. Um, and I know why he blurred this book because there's definitely a mutual connection there but he said Donker's words made me, made me proud to be a black British man which is such a beautiful quote to have on your debut novel this says bright and precocious 10 year old Kwame knows how to behave he knows the importance of good manners how to stay on top of the class and out, out of the way when his mother and father are angry with each other but when his charismatic cousin Yar arrives from Ghana with to live with the family while he looks for work the rules Kwame learnt about the world can no longer guide him 20 years later, Kwame is a secondary school teacher, popular with his students and depended on by friends. His life is spent elegantly weaving between the classroom, the labyrinth of grinder politics and the increasingly intermittent visits to his parents' home. Behind the confident facade, he's driven by caution, the same caution he had as a boy. When electrifying change maker Marcus Felix is appointed as head teacher, Kwame must reckon with himself as he never has before. Can he face the ghosts of his childhood and move through the world without losing who he is? Where does existing stop and living begin? So why I say I think Ashley blurred this and enjoyed it is because he has a background in uh, teaching, as do I. I was a primary school teacher and have a degree in education. And I really like books that centre around like teachers and teaching experiences, particularly like in London and in big cities in the UK. And I think it's uh, yeah an underrated setting to explore. Like this, I always said when I was... Um, working and training that like the school staff room is such a brilliant slice of life you get so many different types of people that work in schools and there's so many stories that are told and it's such an insular environment so i'm excited to see that explored and i think obviously there's stuff in here about um sexuality and it sounds like it's inferring that maybe there's not acceptance of his choices by his family and um yeah it just sounds like it could be a really brilliant character study up next is Fruit of the Dead by Rachel Leon. This cover is definitely in the theme of the book, the kind of covers that I've been having a moment for the last 18 months. Obviously we had the like Renaissance painting, my year of re rest and relaxation kind of vibe, but these more like almost biblical, naked muscular people, <laughs> um, angelic type ones are definitely appearing more often, I guess. Um, but this one, I guess, makes sense for the topic. This is a retelling of Persephone and Dementor. I'm not one for the classics in terms of like ancient classic mythology. Doesn't really appeal to me. Haven't read like the Circes and the um, feminist retellings of Greek myths. Like that's not in my wheelhouse. Doesn't appeal to me. But this, when they are like reimaginings in contemporary settings in society, like then I'm happy to give it a go because I guess I don't need to read it in its original form if that makes sense so this setting is what drew me to this as well it definitely feels like kind of rich people problems energy which sometimes i like a frivolous read like that although this one definitely has a dark undertone it's set on a lush private island off the coast of maine where camp counselor Corey ainsel has taken a childcare job and signed an nda with the ceo of a fortune 500 
pharmaceutical company Rolo, who's middle-aged, divorced, magnetic, but intoxicated by Corey. Um, Plied with luxury and opioids manufactured by his company, she tells herself that she's in charge, but her mother, Ema, the head of a teetering agricultural NGO, senses otherwise. When her daughter sudden seemingly disappears, Ema crosses land and sea to heed a cry for help she alone is convinced she heard. Alternating between these two women's perspectives, Fruit of the Dead incorporates its mythic inspiration with light touch and devastating precision, a lush and haunting story of love, attraction, control, and America's own late capitalist mythos. Mythos, <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Um, this sounds really intriguing, definitely a summary read, obviously. Dark, interested in that pharmaceutical CEO, opioid intervention, kind of questions over that. Um, yeah, sounds like it could be a quick read. Okay, next up is Marta, which I've heard a few people talking about already. This came out on the 7th with Picador by Carve Akbar. Um, and I think it's also simultaneously was published in the state. So this says, Cyrus Shams is lost ever since her mother's plane was seen senselessly shot down over the Persian Gulf when he was a baby. Cyrus has been grappling with her death and now newly sober, he set out to learn the truth of her life. When an encounter with a dying artist leaves Cyrus towards the mysteries of his past, an uncle who rode through the Iranian battlefields dressed as an angel of death, a haunting work of art by an exiled painter, he finds himself once again caught up in the story of his mother, who may not have been who or what she seemed. Cyrus searches for meaning in the scattered clues of his life and a final revelation transforms everything he thought he knew. Electrifying, funny, original and profound. I did hear a couple of comments from friends online who were reading this that it was surprisingly funny, which I've obviously humour is so subjective in books, but I love a literary fiction book that can... Uh, incorporate a sense of humour within the characters that feels realistic. It's blurbed by so many people, Mary Carr, Leslie Jameson, Raven Leilani. Um, so yeah, it, says, it sounds really beautiful and has that mystery on a family quest type element, which I do always enjoy um, and sometimes does propel you through those books. So definitely intrigued. And it's got four stars from 50 members over on NetGalley which is pretty good. Okay, this is by Jennifer Croft, who is quite a well-known translator, has translated a couple of Booker Prize um, books in recent years. And I actually have her a, a book on my shelf from her by, published by Charco Press, which I mean to read called Homesickness. This one is called The Extinction of Irena, Irina Ray, and it's published by Scribe. This one sounds, is giving me, um, what's it called? Drive your plow over the bones of the dead energy. Eight translators arrive in a house on a Polish forest on the border of Belarus. It belongs to a world-renowned author, Irina, Irina Ray, and they, they are there to translate her magnum opus. But within days of their arrival, she disappears without a trace. The translators who hail from eight countries but have a reverence of their, shared reverence of their beloved author begin to investigate why she has gone while proceeding with work on their masterpiece. They explore the ancient wooded refuge with its intoxicating slime moulds and study her exotic belongings and layered texts for clues. But doing so reveals secrets and deceptions of Irina Ray's that are utterly unprepared for. Forced to face their differences, they grow increasingly paranoid about this fever dream of isolation and obsession. The soon the translators are tangled up in a web of rivalries, desires, not only threatening their work, but the life of their beloved author too. Hilarious and thought-provoking an examination of art, celebrity, the natural world, and the power of language. Yeah, it does sound like pretty kooky crazy weird. Um, offbeat and strange, which is why I'm thinking the setting, the um, incorporation of the natural parts of uh, the like geographic landscape, which we saw obviously in Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead, um, and also that element of like translators it's a bit meta i guess the author being a translator herself um yeah i don't know just very intriguing feels like it might be quite brain heavy like big brain would need to concentrate but yeah intrigued i always say that word in these videos <laughs> speaking of fitzcarraldo this is tell by jonathan buckley which is a novel it's a non-fiction but it's a fiction novel but structured i guess as if it is non-fiction so it says it's a series of interview transcripts with a woman who worked as a gardener for a wealthy businessman an art collector who's disappeared who may or may not have taken their own life a thrilling novel of strange intoxicating immediacy 
um, and it won the Fitzcarraldo most recent novel prize. Very short blurb for it, but um, intriguing mystery, but like a literary mystery. Again, Drive Your Plow had that energy. And I think Fitzcarraldo publishes some really books that have that really propulsive nature to them and have that mystery element, that uh, that secrecy, that unknown, but they are still sentence by sentence, like beautifully constructed, very masterful in the way that they're, these authors write. And I think that's what, to me, sets apart a Fitzcarraldo book from some other publishers, is I, I feel like they have a lot of trademarks with their, with their novels um, and their nonfiction books, to be fair. So I always feel in safe hands, even if I don't love the book that I read, I feel like I always get something out of a book from this indie publisher, which is why I'll go back again and again to read them. So that is Tell. Okay, up next is one that I am so excited for, which I put in various vlogs because I was so lucky to have a proof. Um, an online friend, Amelia, sent it to me. She works at Viking, and this is Wandering Stars by Tommy Orange. I loved Tommy Orange's first book, There There, which is like an interconnected set collection of short stories building up to like a bigger novel about a powwow event of a Native American community in Oakland, California. And this, again, follows the Native American indigenous community uh, through, I think, nearly from the early 20th century all the way to present. So it says, this follows um, to, oh no, even earlier, two centuries of history from the, holy, the horrors of the Sand Creek massacre in 1864, which I was reading about the other day because it has some very strange connection to um, Mormonism, which is something I like to read about, to the aftermath of the shooting in the early 21st century, an indelible novel of America's war of its own people, a tender shattering story of many generations of a singular Native American family, searching for ways through displacement, addiction, pain towards hope and home. I, I've heard from so many people how devastating this book is. I have actually packed it to take on holiday, um, but I think Tom, my partner, who loves Tommy Orange and absolutely loves to read books about indigenous community particularly in Canada but also in the states so I think he will definitely read this and tell me on a scale of one to ten how emotionally stable I need to be to read it because it sounds pretty tragic but obviously vitally important okay this one changing tone a little bit this is The Divorcees uh, by published by Bonaire in the UK which I think are an indie I'm not 100% sure on the 28th of March. This is set in the 1950s, which doesn't always appeal to me, but I like the Stepford Wives aesthetic. Um, what was that shit Harry Styles film um, with Florence Pugh? That kind of um, aesthetic in terms of like the furniture, mid-century modern, the outfits, the Stepford Wives, like all of that I find very intriguing. And this sounds like it definitely embraces that energy. So it says, um, Louis Sanders is thought that marrying the right man would finally cure her, oh Lois, would finally cure her loneliness. But as the picture perfect as her husband was, she's suffocating in their loveless marriage. In, in 1951 though, unha unhappiness is hardly grounds for divorce, except in Reno, Nevada. At the Golden Yarrow, the most respectable of the Reno's divorce ranches, Lois finds herself living with half a dozen other would-be divorcees, all in Reno for the six week residency that the state's in the state's only divorce requirement. They spend their days riding horses and in their nights flirting with cowboys. It's as wild as, and fun as Lake Forest, Illinois was prim and stifling. But it isn't until Greer Lang arrives and Lewis's, Lois's world truly cracks open. Gorgeous and beguiling, indifferent to social convention, Greer is unlike any, anyone Lois has ever met. She sees something in Lois that she, no one else ever has. Under her influence, Lois begins to push against the limits that have always restrained her. But how much can she trust this mysterious new friend and how will she forge independence on her own? Really love the whole exploring the like le legalities and the sort of, I guess, like feminist women's history element of this because um, I just, I didn't know, like this divorce ranch concept of like having to be in a residency for six weeks. And I know even now in the UK, like the, we have some really, arcane laws around separation and divorce and this sounds like it could be really fascinating I guess like a little unknown bit of history which I love if I'm going to read like a book not set in the last 20 years but something in the 20th century I really love to learn you know little tidbits like that like I think this could be really fascinating but also has that romp element and all of those aesthetic things I mentioned incorporated so 
Yeah, I don't know, that one I think could be a little hidden gem. Okay, this up next is Scrap by Kala Henkel. Kala Henkel wrote Other People's Clothes, which I never got around to reading, but I do have on my shelf. And my mum and my boyfriend read it and said it was like pretty good. This is out on the 14th by Skepta. Um, I think I was interested in this one because it was blurbed as being quite funny in places, I think. So it says, recently dumped and stuck with the mortgage, artist Esther Ray wants to burn the world, but instead she accepts a scrapbooking job from the deliriously wealthy Naomi Duncan. The scrapbooks, a secret gift for Naomi's husband, trace the Duncan's 25 year marriage. The conditions, Esther must include every piece of paper she's been sent, must sign an NDA, Ooh, lots of NDAs in the books this month, and must only contact Naomi using a burner phone, otherwise she will spoil the surprise. That's very extreme. As Esther bins true crime podcasts and works through the 200 boxes of the Duncan's detritus, she finds herself infatuated with this gilded family until mid project, Naomi dies. Wow, I feel like that's quite a big, not spoiler, but like, I feel like if I was them, I would have left that out of the blurb. Um, when Esther becomes convinced the husband killed her, she uses the scrapbook trove of information to insert herself into the Duncan's life just to prove it. The more Esther investigates, the more she's dragged back to the scorched earth of her past and the famous artist who paid her to disappear. Laced with pitch black humor and conspiratorial unease, a razor sharp examination of wealth, power, art, and truth. Again, it's giving rich people problems, which sometimes I enjoy that frivolity in my reading, particularly in the warmer months, particularly when I'm poorly. I'm just like, sounds utterly bizarre that you're like being paid to make scrapbooks. I don't know, just like really odd premise. But I remember her first book, Other People's Clothes, had this odd like landlord spying on young women living in this flat in Berlin. Like she does like sort of the eerie and the creepy. So kind of tracks. Okay, what's next? Sorry, my laptop's so slow at loading. I think we're still on novels. Oh yes, Malma Station by Little Brown, published by Little Brown on the 7th. Again, this is like outside of the realm of, like these books seem a bit more plot heavy, I guess this month, a couple of character studies, but yes, this says, on board the train to Malma Station, a married couple in crisis, a single dad with his young daughter and a woman searching to the answer of her mystery, her mother left behind. The enigmatic Harriet, the controlling Oscar and the searching Yana. Each of these characters carry with them the scars of something came, that came before. This book traces the crooked lines of family and history to show how memories take on new shapes, postulating that perhaps the past is actually what we can change rather than the future. The narrative builds like a train hurtling through time, each chapter a separate car, train car hooking onto the next. An enchanting and gut-wrenching novel about family secrets and justice through generations. The thing that actually intrigued me most about this book was the idea of each chapter taking us through the train to meet the different characters. It sounds like it could be interconnected in the way, for example, like Summer Water um, was where you saw the different people in the um, holiday homes and they all sort of mingled and came together. I really like a book like that. It can really, it's really pacey. It can keep you up at night. Like it, it really has that element of, um, of forwardness, like you really want to keep going when you read books like that, for me at least. So Mama Station, definitely one to keep a lookout for. This one I love the cover of. This is called The Hive and the Honey by Paul Yoon, published by Simon and Schuster. I'm not sure if this is translated, but I think it's, no, it's actually not just set in Spain. It says, a boy searches for his father, a prison guard on Sahalin Island. In Barcelona, a woman is tasked with spying on a prize fighter who may or may not be her estranged son. In the Edo period, a samurai escorts an orphan to his countrymen. In upstate New York, a formerly incarcerated man starts a, new a lewd life in a new town and attempts to build a family. A bold, indelible collection that portrays the vastness and complexity of diasporic communities. How does a North Korean defector connect with the child he once left behind? And how do the traumas that haunt a Korean settlement in the far east of Russia? A collection lays of beauty and cruelty. The Hive and Honey is a work of an author at the height of his power. So yes, something about the um, Korean diasporic communities, a set of short stories. Um, I really want to get back into reading short stories this month, so interested. This one, another short story collection, A Small Apocalypse by Laura Chow Reeve, published by Northwestern University Press. So this is a stateside publication. I don't feature a lot of the big American publishers in here because then it gets jumbled with 
release dates and such a thing, but sometimes if they're indie, they will pop up on my radar, especially short stories. This says, it seizes the familiar Florida landscape with postcards and headlines and prize open spaces for unlikely affection and sun-soaked eeriness. A pair of queer friends make themselves at home on the banks of the Suwane River. A family tragedy unfolds in Disney World. Wow, you sold me on that one already. A hurricane floods the theater during an ap apocalyptic movie marathon and a flamingo meets an untimely end at the Jacksonville Zoo. A gorgeously wrought exploration of what it means to exist and the in-between, steeped in swampy, feral heat of Florida, in the dissonance of queerness, hybridity, Asian American identity and cultural inheritance. Um, really like the themes that it sounds like it plays with. You've sold me on the story about Disneyland and um, it sounds like it could play with the uncanny and the slightly out of reality moments, but still has a lot of familiarity. So that is a small apocalypse. Okay, another short story collection, I believe, which is got a beautiful cover. I love this cover so much. This is Barcelona. A young wife is haunted by a past love. A father travels to Paris to meet his scientist son and is exposed to his son's true nature. A woman attends a reading by a famous author and has realizations of her own marriage. This Barcelona reveals the underlying disquiet of modern life and the brutal nature of humanity. On city streets, long car rides, and in suburban living rooms, we catch glimpses of characters who approach those moments of desperation or revelation that change and reshape their fate. Yeah, not much else to add, except that sounds I love a slice of life type story um, collection that has a theme. And I like, this sounds like with the different Spanish uh, cities and stuff, I just, yeah. Sounds okay, next up, uh, non-fiction book, Who's Afraid of Gender by Judith Butler. This needs no introduction. I'm sure most of you know Judith Butler. If you don't, she wrote, it's like a very prolific writer on queer theory and gender. I probably reference her in every uh, academic essay I've written in my life. And this is a book that has been long awaited that people have, um, sort of waiting waiting for her to write her next thing because she hasn't, I think for like a good 20 years, she wrote Gender Trouble, which redefined the way we think about gender and sexuality and confronts the attacks on gender that have become central to right-wing movements today. Yeah, this is, it can be, I guess, like a, a siren can go off in your head if you think about an older person writing about gender, who's afraid of gender, you might start to think like turf alert, but no, she is very, um, as it says, she is very um, offering a new theory of gender, but it's not offering a new theory of gender, but examines how gender has become a phantasm of the emerging authoritarian regimes, fascist formations, trans exclusionary feminists, a vital and courageous book illuminating the concrete ways that gender collects and dispa displaces anxieties and fear of destruction, operating in tandem with deceptive accounts of critical race theory and ze xenophobic panics about migration. The anti-gender movement demonizes the struggle for equality, which fuels nationalism and leaves people, millions of people vulnerable to subjugation. An essential innovation into one of the fraught issues of our time, a bold call to refuse the alliance with authoritarian movements that, and to make a broad coalition with anyone who struggles to, for equality is linked in fighting with injustice, imagining possibilities for freedom and solidarity, a hopeful work of social and political analysis, timely and timeless. In Judith We Trust, I think this is gonna be brilliant. I saw that she uh, sat down with Sean Fay and did like a big interview and uh, live event that I wished I could have gone to back in London. Um, but I think this sounds like it's gonna be so so important, so unifying, so intersectional, and yeah, just hopeful in a lot of ways as well, because I feel like it's a grim time out there for our, for trans people and, and other people who are marginalized in their gender identities that um, we need to now more than ever unify against fascism formations and authoritarian nationalism, which, at its heart is what TERFs are doing. Um, speaking of TERFs, <laughs> this is a non-fiction book called Among the Trolls by Mariana Spring. This, um, I think, deals with the conspiracy theory online element. I don't necessarily think it's based on the author's experience of like being trolled, but she is, um, Mariana Spring is a BBC journalist who meets the people spreading online conspiracy theories and their victims 
Far from lone wolf, she uncovers a staggering network of true believers and conspiracy influencers engaged in the international information war. Based on first-hand interviews and original reporting, a book that reveals the human stories behind the fake accounts. This sounds like it really deals with um, conspiracy. I'm sure it talks about like being red pilled and QAnon and Trump and, and all of those things like anti-vax, COVID deniers type people. But it sounds like with her being able to meet and talk to these people, it sounds like it might not necessarily, it doesn't sound to her like she's trying to like revoke responsibility, but more humanize and attempt to understand how individuals are part of a wider system and what vulnerability led them down these internet rabbit holes. It sounds like a, a light version of some of the chapters in Naomi Klein's recent book, um, Doppelganger, but, Doppelganger, but it sounds, again, like it might be a more accessible starting point and probably quite an interesting audio book. So that is Among the Trolls. Up next is another book by Fitzcarraldo. This is The Observable Universe. I saw a friend reading this recently. It came out on the 21st of March and, uh, yeah, published by Fitz. It says, in the early 1990s, Heather McCauldin lost her parents to AIDS. She was seven when her father died and 10 when she lost her mother. Los Angeles, where she grew up with her grandmother, Nivea, was ground zero for the virus and its destruction. Years later, she started researching the history of HIV as a way to deal with her loss, which led her to the realization that AIDS and the internet developed on parallel timelines. By accumulating whatever fragments she could of both images, anecdotes, scientific entries, along with her family's personal history, she forms this journey of what happened to her family that leads to an equally unexpected discovery of who her parents might have been. Simultaneously interrogating what it means to go viral in an era of explosive bio biochemical and viral contagion, she travels along fissures of the hyperconnected world, entwining the technological and personal, the viral and the, the vi virus and the viral, moving between the, the musings on Raymond Chandler and fi film noir to the contemporary malaise and late night Netflix binges with propulsive agility and poetic attunement. At once a history of viral culture, an ode to LA and a memoir of loss and reckoning, a genre bending debut about grief in an internet age. So many tick boxes across this. And like I say, I think Fitzcarraldo really produced and have this trademark um, for their authors to genre bend, to do these sort of like personal and political, personal and macro, weaving together in their storytelling in their non-fiction books it's never just a straight memoir if this, public, if this was published and written for a like top five press in the uk it would just be a memoir of losing her parents to aids but they really bring in all of these bigger cultural questions societal implications and uh, yeah i just um, i always i'm excited when i read the blurbs of these things so that's the observable universe okay taking a steep <laughs> like drive to the left this is maybe not a book that appeals to many but actually that's a lie because when i ever post about f1 on instagram on my stories i'm a lewis hamilton fan, by the way mercedes for life um although really excited for him to go to ferrari so then i guess i'll be a ferrari girl um which shoots me better color wise <laughs> i do get a fair few of you replying and talking to me about f1 so this is one I think I would listen to on audio. It's called The Formula, how rogues, geniuses, speed freaks re-engineered F1 into the world's fasting, fastest growing sport. Um, there's someone I follow on Instagram, Tony Brown. I forget what her middle name is. She is a super cool South African woman who posts and writes as like a journalist and a content creator. And she talks a lot about the business of F1 in through like quite a feminist lens. She talks about the new like Charlotte Tilbury. Uh, sponsorship of the academies and yeah I really like her takes on the business of F1 which is something that I find quite intriguing F1 doesn't really align with my personal politics and my sort of like practice of social justice it is obviously like a deeply privileged um, rich environmentally polluting sport to be a fan of and I can't really explain why I love it I grew up with it my my brother especially watched it. it's probably the only thing we have in common these days um and then Tom and I got back into it a few summers ago through Drive to Survive but anyway that's enough of a side tangent about me justifying why I like F1 people like all kinds of things football is also deeply capitalist so whatever it says the story of F1's world dominance is a near constant transformation 
and experimentation. The sport where the only way to win championships is to land a series of technical moonshots and then do it all over again. Fast cars, big money, beautiful people and glamorous locations. From Monaco to Melbourne, the formula tells the epic story of the sport starting in 1950s Britain, where six years of wartime engineering laid the foundation for the new type of motor car racing to the global star partnership of Senna and Eccleston. Spygate, Crashgate has transitioned into an entertainment juggernaut, the uniquely insightful access to F1's most stories, teams and personalities. From Ferrari to Lewis Hamilton to Christian Horner to Daniel Ricciardo, the formula is a riveting portrait of drivers, corporations, rivalries and audacious gambles that have shaped the sport for half a century. The end result is a high octane history of the, how modern F1 racing came to be, the first book to tell a story of successes and specular, spectacular crashes that led F1 to be in an extraordinary yet precarious moment. More than just a sports story, a story of commercial empire that built in the 20th century, rendered almost obsolete in the 21st and re-emerged to be world dominant today. A disruptor claimed its place in a crowding sports marketplace, cash personality, and an understanding what a sport needs to be in the age of water wall entertainment. Really interesting, like I am interested in the ever evolving nature of F1 in terms of its um, spectacle. For example, like its extension into the US with the Vegas race. Oh my God, there's an air. There's a helicopter ambulance flying by my house. I hope that person's okay. Um, yeah, the spectacle of it and through that commercialization in Drive to Survive and uh, different sponsors and different markets being involved. Like I do find that all really fascinating. And my boyfriend Tom talks a lot about that in relation to football um, with TV rights and the commercial elements that are driving the sport perhaps away from it's like the purists want to see out of football for the love of the beautiful game so yeah I think this one might be a really good audio book for me actually I'm gonna propose it to Tom on the next time we do a road trip I think okay this is a book I saw through an article I think in the observer and again this isn't necessarily my type of um topic I'm not that interested in the economy and sort of <laughs> This is called Private Equity by Carrie Sun, by the way, and I'm not really that interested in private equity, but um, this is like an insider type story, which those books always intrigue me. Like, obviously you want to know the secrets and the it's like that salaciously gossipy nature, I guess, of these types of tell or stories, but often are written from the perspective of someone who's been hard done by, marginalized, in some cases hurt or um, scarred by um, an industry or an experience. So this one says, when we meet Carrie's son, she can't shake the feeling she's wasting her life. She's the daughter of a Chinese, Chinese immigrant, excelled in school, graduated early from MIT, climbed the corporate ladder in pursuit of the American dream. But at 29, she left her analyst job, dropped out of the MBA program, and is trapped in an unhappy engagement. When she gets the rare opportunity to work for one of the world's most prestigious headphone, head fund, hedge funds, she knows she can't say no. 14 interviews later, she's in. She's a sole assistant of, to the firm's billionaire founder, manages his work life, becomes the right hand to an investor who can move mountains and markets in a single phone call. She dives headfirst, eager to impress into the, into the firm's culture, which values return on time above all else. A luxury laden world opens up for her and she learns that money can solve nearly everything. She plays the game to the highest level and amid the ultimate winners in our winner takes all economy, she finds her identity swallowed whole by work. Her physical and mental health is deteriorating and she rethinks what it means to waste one's life. A searing examination of our relationship to work, she illuminates, she illuminates the struggle for the balance in a world of extremes. Private equity is a universal tale of self-invention from a daring to ask what we're willing to sacrifice to get to the top. Obviously, I don't believe in workism and hustle culture and productivity and deeply believe in like socialism and social justice so none of these desires I guess appeal to me but I am interested in that lack of um, self-actualization that these people who do reach the top feel like she says she thought she had the American dream but everything is falling apart that bit I think um, if she can really reflect and critically interrogate it could make for a really interesting read plus that inside a story about like working for the billionaire is always going to interest you if, if you don't if you're looking for you know the other side how the other half live i guess this is another book about um the economy and trading flaws and things like that but this is sounds much more actually of that salacious and tell all wider story as opposed to the personal one this is called the trading game a confession published by penguin on the 5th of march 
it says, um, ever since he was a kid kicking broken footballs on the streets of East London in the shadow of Canary Wolf skyscrapers, Gary wanted something better, a whole lot bigger. When he won a competition raid, run by a bank, the trading game, the prize was a golden ticket to a new life, the youngest trader in the whole city, a place where you can make more money than you've ever imagined, where your colleagues are dysfunctional math geniuses, overfed public schoolboys and borderline psychopaths, they feel like family. When soon you're the bank's most profitable trader, dealing in nearly a trillion dollars a day, where you dream numbers in your sleep and then stop sleeping at all. What happens when the winning starts to feel like losing, when the easiest way to make money is to bet millions on becoming poorer and poorer, and the economy starts to slip off a precipice, your own sanity starts slipping with it. You want to stop, but you can't because nobody ever leaves. Would you stick it or quit, even if it means risking everything? This is, I guess, like a classic rags to riches type tale, but again, sounds like he's gonna interrogate the emptiness of feeling like you've won the meritocracy in terms of the UK context and that you have all this wealth, but you feel empty inside. Um, so yeah, intrigued. Learning to think. A broken system kept her track, but education helped her break three by Tracy King. This is a personal memoir, I think, it sounds like it's trying to be compared to an English version of Educated by Tara Westover, The Liberating Power of Education, which is, you know, something I deeply believe in, but uh, it says, put yourself in Tracy King's shoes, growing up on a normal council estate outside Birmingham, her house is filled with creativity, curiosity and love, but marked by her father's alcoholism and her mother's agoraphobia. By the time she turns 12, her father has been killed, her sister taken into care and her mother ensnared in the promises of born again Christianity. This isn't the stuff of cult documentaries. This is, in fact, an ordinary family trapped, trapped in a broken system. This could happen to anyone without the tools to transform their circumstances. Has Tracy discovered the truth of her father's death and how she managed to find her way out? It uses the word inspiring in the tagline, which I hate that word. Um, I just think it doesn't really say anything. Learning to think is a testament to the power of books and a mirror to the everyday realities of poverty. You guys know I love to read about religion, so... That bit definitely appeals, but like it says, it doesn't sound like it's going to be dramatic in the sense of the way ed educated was, or it's going to lean on those big elements as their plot points. But again, it's the story of a broken system. So it's gonna interrogate those wider questions about poverty in the UK and sounds like the care system and support for young people. Okay, we're nearly there. It's gonna be a long one. This is um, Provincial's Postcards from the, from the Peripheries by Sumana Roy, published by Yale University Press. I was really interested in this one because it deals with geographies um, of people. And it says, who is provincial? In a subversive book, Roy assembles a striking cast of writers, writers, artists, filmmakers, cricketers, talk and tourist guides, English teachers, love letter lovers and letter writers, private tutors and secret keepers whose work and life provides varied answers to, the, to that question. Combining memoir with literary, sensory and emotional history of an ignored people, she challenges the metropolitan dominance to reclaim the joyous dignity of a provincial life. In this wide ranging series of postcards from the peripheries of India, Europe, America and the Middle East, she, she brings us deep into the imaginative world of those who have carried their provinciality like a birthmark. She looks at various historical figures and celebrates the provincial's humour and hilarity, playfulness and irony, belatedness and instinct for carefree accents and freedom, an unprecedented account of provincial life, an alternative portrait of our modern world. The line that got me in this one was challenging the metropolitan's dominance to reclaim the joyous dignity of the provincial life because I do think a lot of our histories and social histories are definitely um, geographically skewed towards these cultural centres which tend to be you know, densely populated areas of cities. So I really like the idea that this is exploring. It sounds quite, um, there's a lot to fit in, but, but yeah, I don't know. I think it could explore something quite unique, I guess, um, if it manages to tie all of these different things together. Okay, finally, this is Nowhere Exactly on Identity and Belonging, published by Penguin on the 26th of March. This is a Canadian book exploring the immigrant experience over three decades, drawing on the author's transnational upbringing and intimate experience of the challenges of leaving one's home to resettle in a new land. Question of identity, how to configure oneself and within this new land, but suggests there's a more fundamental and slippery endeavor than establishing one's identity if we can ever establish a sense of belonging. Can we truly belong in a new home and did we ever belong in the home we left? Where do we belong? And the answer for many is nowhere. 
This uses brilliant prose and candid observation and a lifetime of exploring who we are as individuals, places and communities to examine the, with exquisite sensitivity the difference and the space between identity and belonging, the immigrant experience of loss and gain and the weight of memory, nostalgia, guilt and hope. I really like books about immigration, um, emigration and diasporic communities experiences, leaving somewhere, joining somewhere else, um, particularly cultural difference and obviously a lot of these pe people experience stigma and racism and xenophobia when they resettle in a majority white country, for example, coming to Canada, which is, yeah, I don't know, it just sounds really interesting to explore this, especially the language element between identity and belonging and those different um, linguistic questions about the way we talk about ourselves and where we belong in our geographic centres. So yeah, that is the final book up for March. A bumper month, so many exciting reads. Let me know if any of these are appealing to you or if you've perhaps already read some of them or if they're on your shopping list, I would love to hear it. I'm easily influenced by your comments. So please leave them down below in terms of what you will be purchasing and I will see you all in the next one. Bye.